Back in June, uh, May, June of 2009, I'm always keeping my finger on the pulse of the global jihad. Um, and I was uh, taken aback by these protests in the UK against British returning soldiers. British returning soldiers who were being taunted and um, na the name calling baby killer, uh, you know, the really atrocious fresh from the fields of Iraq and Afghanistan. And there was a group. There was a group that sprang from those egregious events, which is what we find. From these egregious events, good things come, um, that I started to follow and support um, uh, vigorously. Uh, and so I was there watching and chronicling this group from the moment that it was born. So I know. I know who they are and I know what they are. And it was also interesting to watch this campaign because of course in the UK it's far more vicious. I mean we can, we can pat ourselves on the back that it's not that bad here, but we are going there. We're 10 years away from there. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. And so um, it, it, was, it was wild to watch this vicious campaign of defamation and racism, bigotry, so on and so forth. Fierce, it was fierce. And even here in the States, I am smeared with, oh, but you, you know, you're an EDL supporter, as if it's a bad thing. So I am enormously honored and pleased that their leadership could be here with us today to describe to you what's going on in their country and how they are taking the fight to the streets and they're taking the fight back to the enemy. And so it is my great honor to introduce to you Tommy Robinson, one of the leaders of the English Defense League. Thank you. Before I go into an in introduction about our organisation and myself, I'd like to say what a pleasure it is to be here today in New York City on this sacred day. I want to thank Pamela and Robert for the hospitality, for inviting us and giving us this opportunity, and to share a platform today and a room with such brave people. And also, 11 years ago, I think everyone can remember where they were. It's like the world fell still. I can remember where I was. Um, I was a young lad working at Luton Airport at the time. I can remember I can, everything about it. And I just want to say, we felt your pain, we still feel your pain. Um, we, formed as, we formed, as Pamela said, three years ago, just over three years ago, after soldiers were on a homecoming parade for our town. They were met, as Pamela said, with um, shouts of abuse. Their, one of their mothers was spat at. Um, a local lad had died, another local lad I grew up with lost his legs. Um, it wasn't the fact that these Islamists done it, it was the fact that they were facilitated in doing it. They were taken through our local town hall to do it. The police had prior notice that they were going to do it. And when there was a reaction to what they had just done, who was arrested? Members of our community were arrested. They were protected. The police didn't even look at them. And this wasn't the first thing, this was a build-up. This has been going on in my hometown for... 15 years, we've watched the whole town decay and Islamism spread like a wildfire. And it was at this point that we said something has to be done, something has to change, because what's the next step from this, a soldier's funeral? So we have to defend against it, we have to highlight it. Now, at, in the beginning, I wore a mask, I covered my face with a balaclava, um, which probably didn't help our image problem, but um, I, I used a false name. Uh, I'd done all of this because I knew the consequences of what's going to happen for standing up and speaking out against it. I knew the threats of violence would come. I knew the violent attacks would come. I knew the attacks against my property would come. I knew Kev, Kev's had them go to his house with shotguns. He, he's had, um, we've had our cars blown up. I knew all of this would come. Now, after 12 months, they exposed me as who I was, which um, is a blessing, in this, really. I, I didn't want to be exposed, so, but once they exposed it, I thought, right, the mask's off. I'll say it wherever I need to say it. I'll stand on TV now and say it, and, and people have followed. <laughs> And um, so we, we started opposing extremist Islam. Um, uh, Muslim extremist groups, Al Majuddin, Islam for UK, these groups that are all across the UK um, that are supporting terrorism, recruiting on the streets of our towns for terrorism. We started opposing them. And um, from the very start, there was the threats of violence. And we had national demonstrations. We were called racists, all these different things. 
Now, then it comes time, the first, my first Osman warning. An Osman warning, they're not given out lightly. It's an official warning by the British government and the British police. It's a warning against the threat against your life. Now, my first one, I was called down to my local police station, and it was detailed. I've got it in black and white, and it says that due to your outspoken op opposition to Islam, there are members of the local Berry Park community, which is the Islamic community, which um, wish to make an attempt on your life. We know these gangs are armed. This is from the police and dangerous. We cannot protect you 24 hours a day. Our advice to you is to take your family and leave Luton. That's where I've been born and bred. So their advice to me is to leave my hometown. Then they said, we need to see your wife. I said, you need to see my wife. So then later in the evening, they come to my house. They sat my wife down, who was pregnant, and they read her the same morning. So I said to the police officer, how long have you been a police officer? 20 years. Have you ever set a pregnant Muslim woman down and told her that Christians are going to murder her? No. Hit, therein lies the problem, and your advice to us is to leave. Now, that was my first husband warning. I've since had three. Um, I started taking precautions. I started wearing a bulletproof vest. I started being careful about where I was going. And then it dawned on me that if I can't walk down the streets in my hometown, I'm dead anyway. So I've took the bulletproof vest off. I've stopped hiding. And if that moment comes, then it will be in my head held high. Because we're not running anymore. Islam rules with fear and intimidation. You show them any weakness, they'll run all over it. And I say at every one of our demonstrations, look around you, look around this room now. I don't see no scared faces. This is not a scared face. We're ready, we're willing to stand up against the fight no matter what it takes. <laughs> also, we're, we're accused of um, doing, doing, this, doing this out of hate. Nothing we do is, is out of hate. What we do is out of love. Love for our children's future. Love for our queen. Love for democracy. In America, love for your constitution. Love for the First Amendment. Love for the Stars and Stripes. And at the same time, um, we hear legends or heroes. What we do is not heroic, it's not, it's not legendary. What we do is our duty. Uh, heroic and legendary is what the American military, the British military are doing. They're suffering, they're dying in faraway fields fighting against the forces of Sharia. We're threatened with death. There's a possibility of death. Our brothers and sisters, our sons and daughters that are fighting out in Afghanistan and Iraq, they're getting shot at every day. They, they dust themselves off and they walk straight back out there. They're the true legends. They're the true heroes. <laughs> also, this Islamophobe. When I'm from Luton Town. Luton Town is a town of immigrants, yeah? Um, I hear... Sometimes I get crit criticised for this, but multiculturalism, in my view, in my hometown, multiculturalism works, okay? It works. And when people say it doesn't work, they will identify Islam that doesn't work. In Luton, the Sikhs, the Jews, there's not many Jews left, then most of them have been forced out, but the Sikhs, the Jews, the Hindus, the West Indians, they've all integrated into society. Look around this room here today. It's a multicultural audience. The one that don't integrate is Islam. It's the Islamic community. <laughs> and by playing... By blaming it on multiculturalism, we're broadening the problem rather than just highlighting and pinpointing the exact problem, which is Islam as an ideology, which is not integrating and not assimilating. Um, also, I believe your country is 20 years behind ours, and I wish and I'd give anything to turn our clock back 20 or 30 years. What's happening in England? What's happening in Luton? What's happening in East London, in Bradford? Towns like this, they're a blueprint. It's inevitable. Demographics, statistics, birth rate, it's coming to a town near you. You can't, in England, people just move like this and they're all, it's, they're all trying to get away, but you can't keep running. Someone has to identify it, highlight it, and in a country like America, even Australia, look at our country, look at Europe and learn. It has to be stopped and people have to stand up and fight against it now. Also, I hear, it's hypocritical really, I hear um, David Cameron and all our politicians saying that certain regimes, leaders, will be brought to justice, such as Assad will be brought to justice from Syria. Well, one day, our leaders across Europe that are aiding, abetting the Islamization and the destruction of our culture and our people, they will be brought to justice. Yeah. 
also, I, believe, I heard that, um, the fellow talking about Dearborn and what happened in Dearborn, and it was exactly like listening exactly what happened. We had a demonstration two weeks ago now in East London in Walthamstow. Um, yeah, if you YouTube it, have a look at what happened. We went down there and it was all orchestrated. It was orchestrated by the police. It was orchestrated in a way to make, basically cancel our demonstration. We got there, there was thousands of these, this loose allegiance between communists, Marxists, and every other weirdo in the world, along with all the Islamists. And they're all there trying to attack us, and there's bricks coming in, and a brick lands next to me. I go up to the police officer in charge and say, are you actually going to do anything about this? And then they pull our microphone out and say, you can't give your speeches, you, you can't have your demonstration. So why not? We said, because you're going to pro provoke a reaction from this crowd. So again, they took away our freedom, our freedom of speech, our right to assembly, and our democratic rights due to the fear of violence and mob rule and threats and intimidation. And it's exactly the same as he hearing that. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the police officer said, unless you come away, we'll arrest you. Exactly the same. We're doing nothing wrong. We're the ones that are law abiding. And they actually arrested 388 of our supporters. They held them, sat them in the road for six hours, seven hours. Six, seven hours, no toilet, women, not allowed to use a toilet, yeah, pregnant, pregnant women, um, no drink facilities, nothing, held for seven hours, put into the backs of police cars and, uh, and vans and driven to different police stations across the capital because they could, well, what they said was for a prevent of the breach of the peace. So rather than dealing with the Islamists and the violent Muslim gangs that are on the streets, they, they make us the victims. So the victims once and you're the victims again. And it's exa it was exactly the same as listening to that earlier. But this is what's going on now. And luckily, in this country, this is where I get jealous sometimes. When I look at, look at other countries, you've got well-educated people. You've got um, influential people that are fighting this fight. In England, we just have working-class people. We don't have any politicians talking for us. And it makes it easier for them to demonise us and easier, easier for them to slander us. And I w I'm the first to say that I'm not the moral com compass, for, uh, compass for the world. I'm, I'm no angel. But at the same time, we have what we're doing, it we're doing it for the right reasons, and we're standing up for what's right. And so that's why sometimes I have to get jealous when I look to this country and, and hear influential people standing up. I just sit and think, I wish so bad we had someone doing that in our country, but we don't. So we can only do what we do. Um, I'll, I'll just finish on, in a world full of deceit, the, tr the truth would bring a revolution. And I think that if everyone knew the truth, about Islam and the ideology, ideology and what lays ahead, there'll be a revolution tomorrow. It's all of our jobs to put the truth out there, to make sure people understand it, what the ideology is, what Sharia is. And I'll finish on, when we say no surrender, we mean it, we'll live by it, we'll die by it. There'll be no white flag raised, not now, not ever, not in Europe, not in America. God bless.